Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 50. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. If you don't have it, we'll have it on the screens for you to follow along. The word of the Lord starts reading as this wise. His parents went to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of Passover. And while he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Let's pause right here because I can hear the parents already. How you go a whole day and not know your son was with you? Now, let's give some back history. This is a feast of the Passover. They would travel to Jerusalem for seven days to, for, the, for, the, for the feast of Passover. But they would go in caravans. There were large groups of people, right? And they would travel together. So it wasn't uncommon that maybe the preteens or the teenagers were in one section of the caravan and the adults were in another. But can I tell you that oftentimes this is a depiction of the church? That we assume that Jesus is with us. Have you ever been in a space and place where you thought Jesus was there? Just to go verify and realize that he wasn't with you at all. So they've traveled a day, they realized that the boy Jesus was not there. And they checked with the relatives and the acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now it was there after three days, they found him in the temple sitting amongst the teachers, both listening and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. Somebody say amazed. Amazed. And his mother said to his son, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Can I pause here for a second? Have you ever sought something anxiously, passionately, intently, just to get it and realize that it wasn't what you expected? Oh, come on. Have you ever gone after a career because of the amount of money that they were paying or because this was a great opportunity to advance your career path and you didn't expect to lose the quality time with your family. You didn't expect to lose the time that you had to serve at the house of God. You didn't expect to lose the peace that you had because of the stress of the workload. Have you ever pursued a relationship? And got it and realized this ain't what I expected. I didn't expect to lose my peace of mind. I didn't expect to be pulled further away from God. I didn't expect to lose my self-worth and confidence messing around with you. Oh, here we go, here we go. Have you ever pursued Jesus and realized when you got to him, it wasn't what you expected? Because a preacher somewhere sold you a pipe dream about houses and cars and land, but when you got there, you didn't expect him to start challenging your toxic way of thinking. You didn't expect that the relationships that were designed to sabotage your purpose would start to unravel. Have you ever got to a place where when you got it, you realize it's not what I expected? This is where they are. He says to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? They did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. I bet they didn't. I bet they didn't. But it's imperative first when we're starting to look at this is they were expecting Jesus to be somewhere and he wasn't. Then when they got there, I don't understand why they didn't start at the church. Because it said they searched for three days looking for Jesus. If they would have went straight to the church, they would have found him. Isn't it funny how when we are in pursuit of something, we search everywhere else. We go to our friends first, we go to our boo first, we go to our job first, and then our last resort is the church. If I started here, I might would have found the answers that would have saved me some time. But they were expecting certain things and their expectations led to disappointment. But can I tell you that your expectations are the dressing rooms that your hope is being prepared in? 
that your hope goes into these places of expectation to try on mentalities and ideas that we will use as our foundational guiding principles of truth. And maybe, maybe, that the hope that's been deferred in our heart that's made us sick or our level of hopelessness has been because we have been wrapped in unrealistic, unsanctioned expectations. But today we're going to take those off and we're going to experience some freedom. So it's amazing how we see in this passage of scripture that when Jesus was sitting in the temple, the religious leaders were amazed that a 12-year-old is sitting here asking you questions. Just think about this right now. If a 12-year-old came and sat down with you and started asking you questions about your life, the first thing you're going to say is, well, you're young. <laughs> Where your mama? But they were amazed. They were astonished. Now, there were six passages in Scripture in the New Testament where amazed was used in this context, right? This is where people were deeply amazed, and I'm going to give you all six. The first one is found in Matthew 12 and 23, where Jesus healed a demon-possessed man who was both blind and mute. Both blind and mute. Now, what's the takeaway for your life? Because some of us have been that same man, both blind and mute. But there is coming a season where God is about to heal your vision and restore your voice. And the people who are around you are going to be amazed because they're used to the version of you who was unable to have a proper perspective or have the strength to speak up for yourself. But there is a time that is coming, hear me, for some of us where God is about to heal your vision and restore your voice. Somebody say, God, heal my vision and restore my voice. The second aspect where these people were amazed when Jesus was coming walking on the water and the disciples were in a boat. Now, I absolutely would have been amazed. If I'm in a boat and see somebody walking on the waves, I might be extremely amazed. But he was walking in the midst of the storm coming to them, and when he got in the boat, everything shut down. And they were amazed. Much like some of you are going to be amazed when God shows up in your storm. Now, I don't, this isn't for everybody, but for some of you who have been in that space where you have been in a, 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 a consistent storm in your life, where it seems like it's been one thing after another, it seems like that you can't get your bearings. Every time you take one step forward, it's three steps back, and you're doing all that you know. Trust me when I say, Holy Spirit sent me here to let you know that Jesus is about to show up in your storm. Yeah. That these waves have been going on long enough. That the times that you have been seeking God and have not been able to find him, he's about to show up. But here's the catch. He's not going to stop the storm until you find him. Jesus was walking on the waves. And they looked out to him and they were amazed. He could have stopped the storm from way back where he was. But God is saying in this season, I'm not going to stop this storm. I'm going to need you to locate me. And have the confident assurance to know that if I'm in this storm, it won't take you under. So they were amazed in this passage of Scripture. Now, the, 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 the third was this passage of Scripture where Jesus was not where he was expected to be uh, in Luke 2 and 47. The fourth and fifth were in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit of God fell on the people. And Acts chapter 2 verse 7 and then Acts chapter 2 verse 12. And they were amazed that this group of people who grew up in the same place, who were speaking the same language, all of a sudden start speaking in other tongues. Now that is the equivalent of if I spoke Spanish, you spoke Italian, you spoke German, you spoke French, and this group of people all of a sudden start speaking in languages and we heard it in our own language. They had no ability to learn our language. Rosetta Stone hadn't been invented. And so they were amazed that when the Spirit of God sat down on them, they start speaking in other tongues. Can I tell you that God is about to give you language for rooms you have not been exposed in? I don't think you understand that God is preparing you in this dark season to step into the place he has prepared for you. And your thought is, well, God, how can I get ready? How can I get ready? He says, I need you to lock in with me because when you step in, I'm going to give you the language. I'm going to give you insight, but it, it all comes as a byproduct of your proximity with me. Because I am tapped into the Father, he can tell me the things that I don't know. Because a lot of times we're asking God for the runes 
instead of the wisdom. We're asking God, God, elevate me. When is it my turn? Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Be honest, it's a safe space. When is it my turn? And he's saying, I can't give you the room yet because you haven't sought me for the wisdom. Because if I give you the room without the wisdom, you'll look like a fool in the room that I promised you. So they were amazed. And then the sixth aspect was when Paul, who was Saul at the time, went from persecutor to preacher. Amazed. That he showed up, the same guy who was killing Christians, is now preaching the message of Jesus the Christ. That's found in Acts 9 and 21. I would be amazed. Uh, wasn't you just killing us? And you want me to hear your, you preach to me? Uh, I, I don't necessarily know about that. But all of these places in Scripture, people were amazed and shocked and caught off guard. Here's my question. How do you process when things catch you off guard? How do you process when something catches you completely off guard that you had not prepared for? Because how you process will determine how you progress. So that's what we're talking about today. The title for this sermon is, I'm Still Processing. And I don't know if you've ever been in a space where something caught you completely off guard, that you couldn't prepare for, something that you didn't expect that shook the very foundation of your world. How did you process? Because just like there were six aspects of scripture where people were amazed and they had to process, God showed me there are often six ways in how we process. And I'm gonna give you all six of those. And the goal by the end is to help us process in the levels of our purpose instead of the levels of our pain. Because the first way we normally process when we're caught off guard is we stop the process. You ever had something stop you in your tracks? Somebody said something to you and yet, oh, mm -mm. got an email at work that stopped you in your tracks. And when we stop the process, it's nine times out of 10 because we don't understand the loss of a loved one. Suddenly, it stops you because I don't understand. A loss of a job that you worked for years, it stops you. I don't understand. The loss of a relationship that you thought, it stops you because we don't understand. And a lot of times that's what happens with our relationship with God, is when we don't understand, we stop. God is saying, this is what I need. And I that doesn't, I don't understand, I don't comprehend that. But can I tell you that God is never going to slow down to make it make sense for you? The Bible says that his thoughts are as high as ours as the heavens are from the earth. So we will not understand what he's doing. But I'm going to give you a tip. Here's the first step in understanding God. You ready? The first step in understanding God is having the understanding that you will never understand him. The first step in understanding God is having the understanding I will never understand him. How many times do we try to fit God into our box of comprehension? Where God is trying to show you something, stretch you out of something that's never been done in your bloodline. And we're saying, God, I don't understand that. I don't know how you're going to do that. So I'm going to stop until it makes sense for me. But see, if you are waiting on logic to kick in, you don't need faith. You don't need it. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we're asking God, make it make sense to me. No, because I need you to step in faith because that's where you're pleasing to me. So that's what we do. The first thing that we do is we stop the process because we don't understand. Imagine being Abraham and God waking you up. And he said, hey, get your family, get all your belongings, and start walking. And you'll go to a land I'm going to show you later. Okay, 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 God. You want me to move my whole family 
and just start walking? Absolutely. And imagine Abraham coming into the room. Hey, hey, everybody get up. Y'all ready? Get your stuff. Pack your bags. Get your toys. Where are we going? I don't know. <laughs> wait, wait. So why are we leaving? Because I heard God say it. This is the place where his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Because I heard what God said, so I don't need to see what he sees. And if I can get to that place where I don't need to understand it because I know who holds tomorrow. I don't have to understand how this is going to work together for my good because it doesn't feel like it, but I know who's already there. So it's in a place where we stop the process. Stop the process. The second thing that we do is we refuse to process. Now, this is generally what happens when we are hurt, when there's trauma, when there's pain. We refuse to process. When you have been broken, the thing that we do when we are broken is we isolate and we insulate. This is how we preserve ourselves. We isolate from people and we insulate in our emotions. And I know, I hear you, I hear you. You're saying, Will, you don't know what's been done. I'm just trying to hold on to the pieces I got left. I'm just trying not to fall apart. I'm just trying to make it through this season. I'm just trying to hold on. But can I tell you that whenever you are preserving the pieces that you have left, you are also preserving your brokenness? That isolation is life support for brokenness? We think that I am going to protect myself. I'm going to hold on to the pieces that I got left. I just can't. I got kids. I got people counting on me. I got a spouse. I got responsibilities. I can't break here. I get it. But when you think you're preserving just your pieces, you are also preserving your brokenness. And we can't get healed while we are insulated. It's not to the place where I realize that I got to just let these pieces go and expose it to God because I know that God can do more with the pieces than I could do the whole thing. So it's the aspect of knowing that I may be hurt, but I cannot refuse to process. Because if I refuse to process, I am cultivating a place of brokenness in my life. And this is how. This is how we pass down generational hurt. Because everybody's trying to hold on to the pieces. I'm just trying to make it through. If I could just make it through. And God is saying, if you give me the pieces, I can restore what was broken so that your children don't have to carry the weight of the brokenness that you experienced. So we refuse to process. What's the third thing that we do? Get your toes ready. (laughs) The third thing that we do is we delay the process. This is where we give God all of our excuses. Raise your hand if you yourself or if you have heard someone say, God knows my heart. <laughs> Ooh. God knows my heart. And we use this as an excuse to justify our inability to do what we're supposed to do. Well, why aren't you? God knows my heart. Well, ain't you supposed to be? Well, what had happened was, and we keep God, trying to give God our excuses. You heard God tell you to, there's so many books in this room, I feel it, that should have been written three to five years ago. But we keep delaying the process because we're looking for the perfect time. This is when we are delaying because God knows my heart. Can I tell you that he does know your heart? Jeremiah 17 and 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Of course God knows it. And every time we say that, he's saying, I know. That's why I'm trying to use you in spite of your heart. (laughs) But we delay because we think we got time. You heard God tapping you. Hey, hey, come here. Well, I'm not finished with what I want to do yet. 
So we delay, we give so many excuses. I can't tell you how many excuses I've given God over the course of my life. Well, I heard him calling me and I went the opposite way. Because I thought that when I finished with what I wanted to do, then I could step in and be fully committed to what God wanted me to do. But we give God all of these excuses and we lean back on the aspect of grace. Well, God's going to give me grace. I got grace. Don't judge me. You can't judge me. I'm under grace. Can I tell you grace is not a get out of jail free card? We keep giving God all of these excuses. But God gives you a window of opportunity, not a warehouse. There are windows of opportunity that are designed for you to step in to do what you are created to do. I, I'll prove it to you. Have you ever had an idea, sat on it, and then a few years later you saw that same thing? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Look at that. Right? God gives us a window, and what does he do? He opened the window and said, you coming? You coming? Hey. You coming or not? Okay. Lock that one. You coming? Absolutely. Because we're standing in the rooms and God is like, hey, I need you now. And, he's, and we're like, yeah, yeah, I know God, but in a minute. In a minute. No, 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 I'm going to come. I'm going to come, but just give me a little time. And God is like, what I'm trying to do in the earth is for here and now. I was talking with Sanchez and and we were talking about, he was like, you know, a lot of, I don't want to get to heaven and see what my life could have been like. I said, I know. What I also don't want to get to heaven is to see is how many people could have been brought to Christ if I would have said yes. If I would have said yes, God, how many people could you have saved through my yes? How many things could we, how could we have shifted our culture, shifted community, if I just stopped giving you excuses and say yes? So we delay, we delay the process. But then when we grow, we like to prioritize the process. This is when we start growing up. This is when I say, you know what? I got to stop playing with God. And I got to make you a priority. Well, I got to be intentional about our relationship, and I have to be intentional about our time. Listen, praying while you are driving, praying while you're in the gym, praying while you are at your office, those are all great. But those are inclusive moments, not exclusive moments. And so much of our interactions with God... It's us making inclusive moments to include you in my day, in my plans, in my relationship, and we haven't taken the time to make exclusive moments to where it's just me and you. I'm at the point in my life, God consistently, he'll wake me up between three and five in the morning, and I get up and I love it. Why? Because it's nothing going on. It's just me and you. I don't have my phone going off on notifications. I'm on do not disturb. Why? Because these are exclusive moments where we build our relationship. This is when I get exclusive. This is when I make an intentional investment in my relationship. Because if I'm just asking God to do what he desires to do in my life, and all I'm doing is including him, including him. Imagine a marriage where the only time you went out on dates is in a group. The only time you spend time with your spouse is in a group. How quickly would it be to lose sight of each other? How quickly would it be to disconnect? How quickly would it be to be frustrated and all the wives said, amen. Imagine being in a marriage and the only time you spend time is in a group. Eventually we're going to say, well, can we have some one-on-one time? Can it just be me and you? Is our time not enough that you have to have everything and everybody else involved? 
But when I prioritize the process, that's when I start to say, no matter what's going on, I am going to make my call and election sure. Because 1 Peter 2 and 9 says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is when I am making myself exclusive. It's me and you because I realize that I've been chosen and set apart. And my relationship should be indicative of the fact that I know who I am to you. And I realize finally who you are to me. So, so we, we delay the process, then we prioritize the process, and then as we continue to grow, we commit to the process. If we had to characterize our relationship, I wonder how many of our relationships with God would be fully committed or we just talking. Who? When we start taking honest assessments, am I committed to you for real? Or are we just talking? Because when you know if you have a relationship and somebody say, well, what are you? Oh, we just talking. What does that mean? I don't claim you. That, that we're not together. That you don't have no rights and privileges. You can't ask me where I'm going. You don't have access to what I'm doing. We're just talking. But when I commit to you, I give you access. Because my question is, I don't know if how many of us really understand that if we start assigning that label to us to say, well, you know, we're just talking, that that goes both ways. And a lot of people are acting God, acting with God that we're just talking, that I'll casually talk to you. I'll pray when I feel like it. I'll read my word if I decide that I want to get some good sleep. Or I'll just go throughout my day, do my own thing, and bring you my, my broken pieces. Can I tell you that Jesus ain't your side chick? This is a place where we got to say, I got to grow up and commit. Because if I don't commit to him, and if I am ashamed of him, the Bible says he will be ashamed of me when he comes back in all of his glory, in the, in the presence of the angels and the Father. This is how people are going to get to the end and say, God, God, did not cast out demons in your name. I lay hands on the sick and they recovered. And God going to say, when they're at the gate, hey, Jesus, you know them? You know them? Them your people? They at the door, they ringing my doorbell. They with you. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. De God, I never knew them. Because how much time have we spent just talking with God? But when I commit to it, listen, there ain't an am amount of money that you can pay me to walk away from my post. Amen. There ain't nothing you can say to me. I don't care how much they paying over there. I don't care what they got going over there. I am committed. For God, I live and for God, I'll die. I'll give him my yes every single day. When it's uncomfortable, I'm committed. When it's lonely, I'm committed. When it's hard, I'm committed. And that's what we got to get to is when we are committed. Committed every day to get closer. Committed every day to be better. I'm committed to the process. I'm committed to it. And the last thing that we do is after we have stopped the process, refused refuse the process, we delay the process, we prioritize the process, we commit to the process, when we reach a level of growth, we learn to trust the process. This is the hardest most important part of the entire way you process, to trust the process. See, when I trust the process, I don't resist, I relinquish. When I trust the process, I don't resist his correction, I relinquish my control. I don't need to be in the driver's seat when I trust who's driving. You ever been in a car with somebody who can't drive? Oh, Jesus. 
You got your own pedals in the passenger seat. You, ah, <laughs> ah, you, you, you honking horns. That's not the, ah, you turning wheels. When it can't drive, I can't trust it. But I know who's driving. I've been in a car with him for a long time. I've seen how he's navigated my inconsistencies. I've seen how he's navigated my hurt. I've seen how he's been those turns when I was inconsistent and I turned away from him. When I was unfaithful, I've seen him. I've seen the times when I didn't know how it was going to turn out. And I thought like it was going to be the end. And somehow, some way, he made a way. This is why I trust him. Because I know who he is. I got experience with him. I go back down the history and the, the corridors of my history and memory lane, and I realize that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The reason why I can trust him is because he's never going to fail. The reason why I can trust him is because even when I don't get it right, there's grace. I can trust him because he has a plan to prosper me and to give you a future and a hope. I can trust him. And when I trust him, I don't need to trace him. When I trust him, I don't need to see what you're doing. I don't need to know your every move. I don't need to be checking up behind you when I trust you. I don't need to know exactly when you're going to do it, how you're going to do it. All I need to know is that you're going to do it. I trust it. I don't care if it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Abraham waited 20, 20 plus years, 25 years. Trusting. I trust him. The Bible says in Hebrews, I mean Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. The reason why we can't really trust for real is because we've given God pieces of our heart. And I can't trust you until I give you all of it. Trust is risky. And I know there are times where you trusted people and you got dropped. I know there were times where you trusted people and they turned their backs on you. Where you trusted people and all of a sudden the thing that you were hoping and believing for came crashing down. I know. But if I can't get to a place where I say, God, you know, I know that they failed me. But I'm going to trust you for real. I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to go all in. I'm pushing all money into the table. I'm, whatever you need from me, I'm going all in. If I can't trust you with all my heart, I will keep sabotaging the process because I am operating with you off of a perspective of pieces. So anything, if I'm looking at you through a lens of a broken lens, Anything that hits a sharp edge and reminds me of my last drop, I will then refuse the process. Anything that reminds me of the last time that someone told me that they were going to be there and didn't, I will stop the process. But it's when I get to the place where I'm committed, where I can say, I don't care what they did. I can't keep charging you for man's mistakes. How many times... Have we made God pay for what man did? When something happens with a church, and listen, I've been there. We don't leave just that church. We leave God. And he's like, I didn't even do nothing. Because if he was locked in with me, I might have been able to tell you a little bit more. But we keep making God pay. But when I trust the process... I realize that it may not happen my way. It may, it may not come the way I desire it. But I trust that even when I don't get my way, that your way is best for me. This is the prayer. Not my will, but th your will be done. See, I don't know if we oftentimes know what we're praying. We're saying, God, not my will. He said, okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Because now I get to do what I always want to do in your life. Now I get to mold you and shape you. And we keep looking at God. God, I want to be blessed. I want to be elevated. I want to be healed. I want to. He said, okay, cool. The way I'm going to take you there 
It's through the pathway of the development. So not only you get what I promised you, but you're able to sustain it. When you ask God for mountaintops, expect valleys. When you ask God for blessing, expect breaking. Why? Because if I just give it to you and you haven't prepared for it, you're going to lose what I gave you. So if you're saying, God, I want to be the person that you called me to be and I want to walk in my purpose and I want, to, I want to fulfill my destiny, okay, let's get here in this wilderness and let's develop some things. Let's, let's strip yourself of some toxic thinking, some toxic relationships so when you step over there, you can stay there. See, this is when I trust it. When I trust the process, it doesn't matter what I lose because I know in the end I win. I'll take a right now loss because I know a win is coming. It doesn't matter if it's loss after loss after loss after loss after loss. I trust it because he promised me a win. And even if you're in a place where you say, you know, Will, I've been in that space where it's just been a, a, a season of losses. It's been two years, and it just seems like loss after loss after loss after loss. If I told you that you had 20 years of wins and success on the other end of the two wins of losses, how committed would you be to it? Because you know I just got to get through this season. And when I trust the process, I realize I just got to get through this season because I know what he said. I know what he promised me. When I trust him, I can give all of myself to him. When I trust him, the only time I abandon ship is to walk on the waves with him. That's the only time I'm jumping out of here, is if you call me out the ship. But as soon as the waves hit, how many of us jump ship? This ain't working. Nope, mm -mm, that hurt. Didn't like it. Pineapples. And we get to that place where we're saying, I'm, let me jump out because it don't feel right. But if I have committed to this thing and I trust it, then I know if it don't feel right, then it's working something out of me. I know that if it's crushing me, that's just because he's developing me. I trust this process. But the only way I can trust the process is if I know the truth. See, some of us can't trust the process because we don't know the truth. All we know is our experience. And our experience has proven that you can't really believe what people say. Yeah. Our experience has proven that we tried pastors and it didn't work out. Our experience has proven is that when I tried God, everything in my life turned upside down. But when you know the truth, you can start to trust the process. My question is, how much truth do you know? How much truth are you aware of? Because the reason why I can trust it is because I know without a shadow of a doubt that there is no good thing he will withhold from those who walk upright before him. I know without a shadow of a doubt, just as Paul said, that after I suffer a while, that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. I know the truth. I know that the book says that after I have suffered a while, he will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle me. That's why I don't have no problem suffering, because I know the truth. That's how I can trust it. If you don't know the truth, you can't stand on it. See, they too busy standing on business. I'm standing on Bible. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment, I shall condemn. I know the truth. That's why I can't be swayed. I can trust him. I can hear my grandmama say, you can't make me doubt him. Because I know too much about them. I know too much. I don't care what it looks like. I may look like a fool walking away from that six-figure contract, but I know what he said. I can trust the process because I know him. And I don't think oftentimes that we have a trust issue as much as we have a truth issue. It's not that I don't trust you. I just don't know the truth. So I'm approaching you with my brokenness through the lens of a lie that culture told me. 
So I'm approaching you through the lens of my situation and my perspective is off because I haven't learned the truth. But when I know it, I can stand on it. When I know it, I can't be shaken. When I trust it, I can stand strong and firm and knowing that come hell or high water, I know who God is. I know what he promised. And even if it doesn't look like it, I trust the process. I'm committed to this thing. He is my priority. He is not my accessory. I don't just use him when I need him. I need him every moment of the day. I need him. And when we get to that place where we can say, God, I need you more than anything. We can trust the process. Then we can progress effectively. Everyone standing, everyone standing. I don't know where you are in your process. I don't know what you have been dealing with, what you may have lost. I don't know where you are, but it's my prayer that this be the year that you process effectively, that you process through the lens of your purpose and not your pain. I know what they said, I know, I know what you lost, and I know how much it hurt. But if you let that stop your process, what God wanted to do through the pain and the loss, he will never do. So we got to get to the place where God, I am committing to this process. Come hell or high water. When I was laying in the hospital bed, 2000, I had a sinus infection spread to my brain. I had a stroke that left me paralyzed on the complete left side of my body. Doctor said I would die or live in an unresponsive state for the rest of my life. In that moment, I said, God, you know what? I know you've been calling. And I may not get it all right, but what I can promise you, I'm going to give you everything I got. And that's all he needs is your surrender. You are never going to be perfect. All he needs is you for, for you to surrender to the only one who is. Because he is perfect at handling our imperfections. So we're going to pray about our ability to process. And I'm believing today that God is going to heal hearts. He's going to restore minds and perspective, vision and your voice. Some of you have been silent and mute, just accepting whatever's been tossed on you. And today God is going to heal your vision and restore your voice. I'm believing it. But before we do that, I want to give everyone opportunity because these are promises to the believer. And if you are not a believer, with every eye closed, with every eye closed, if you are not a believer and you don't have this relationship with the living God that doesn't give you the rights and access to the privileges that we are discussing, and you say, I want to have a relationship with this God. I want to process effectively. I want to heal. I want to step into my purpose. If that's you, let me see your hands. I see hands. I see hands. Thank you for your vulnerability. I see hands. Every eye still closed. This is a sacred moment. I see hands. Okay, now with your hands down, this is what we're going to do. We're going to all say this prayer together. Because even as we, at the, in the places that we are, right now currently there are still moments where we need to go back and refresh there may be moments where we need to go back and repent we need to go back and reconnect so we're going to save this prayer and if this is the first time you're going to pray this prayer we're going to celebrate you and honor you and then we're going to pray a prayer that, that's going to unify the house so everybody with your eyes closed repeat after me Jesus I need you forgive me of all my sins I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. I believe that you were crucified for my sins and resurrected with all power in your hands. I believe that because you got up, I can get up. 
out of my dark places, order out of my graves, and access the freedom that you have for me. I surrender my heart and I ask that you save me from my sin, from the traps that the enemy has for me, and save me from myself. This day, I declare that you are Lord, and I ask you to be Lord over my life. Today, I declare that you are mine, and I am yours forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that was your first time, whew, if that was your first time praying that prayer, if that was your first time praying that prayer, let me see your hands. First time praying that prayer. If you see somebody with their hands up, will you love on them? Celebrate them. Give me some. Come on. Come on. Come on. Heaven is rejoicing. Welcome home. Welcome home. You don't have to run no more. Welcome home. So now that we are all family, we're going to pray a prayer about your perspective and healing, and God is going to release something in this atmosphere that's going to shift the very trajectory of your life. You ready? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your people. We honor you, Holy Spirit, for the moment that you have created, and we thank you right now that you are shifting perspectives in this very moment. God, I pray that you will enter into every broken place, every broken lens of our perspective and put our pieces back together. Father God, I ask right now that you begin to restore hope, that you begin to restore joy, and that you begin to allow your, your presence to just infiltrate every part of our being. God, I thank you that these people will no longer operate from brokenness, that they will no longer see you from a broken lens. God, heal their, their vision and restore their voice. I pray, God, for every distraction to be removed, every hindering spirit to be cast down. Satan, the Lord rebuke you and the blood of Jesus be against you. I bind up every demonic attack on these your people these sons and daughters of God I thank you right now for freedom now Holy Spirit let freedom sweep the room freedom sweep the room God freedom in our perspective freedom in our emotions freedom in how we operate freedom from toxic thinking freedom from toxic relationships freedom from the places that are not designed for me God, let us walk in freedom and experience the power that you have in store for us. Holy Spirit, just like you did in Acts when we were all on one accord, sweep the room and let your spirit rest on your people. Let this be a week of resurrection where you're resurrecting dreams, resurrecting hope, resurrecting ideas, resurrecting faith, let this be a week of resurrection, God. Pull them out of the darkness and the emotional quicksand they've been sinking in. We thank you, God, that this week would be a week of resurrection. Thank you for healing our perspective. Thank you for putting our broken pieces back together and for allowing us the opportunity to recommit to the process. Thank you, God, that even though we are still processing, that you are intimately invested in our process. And we give you glory for everything that you've done here today. In the mighty, matchless, and magnificent name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Somebody shout out amen. Somebody shout amen.